synergism, home, and church. Synergism. It's a beautiful word. We'll get into it later. I'd like to begin with this uh, funny story. It's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> a young married couple wanted children, and they were infertile. And unable to have any, they went to see their priest, of all people. He suggested to the husband that he go to a certain shrine in Greece on the island of Tinos, pray and, larg and lar light a large candle. The husband took him up on it. He went to Tinos, to the shrine. He prayed, he, and he lit a very large candle. In fact, he, he, <laughs> he lit the largest one he could find. In the meantime, the priest was transferred to another city, another parish. After 15 years, he came back to the city and he decided to visit the couple. He knocked on the door and the door opened and he saw, of all things, a house full of children. They were on the table, under the table, <laughs> on the chairs, under the chairs, everywhere, all 12 of them. So greeting the wife, he exchanged a few pleasantries, and he asked to see the husband. And the wife said to him, sorry, you can't see the husband, my husband, because he went to the island of Tinos, she said, he said, Tinos? Why Tinos? And the wife confided to him and said, to blow out the candle. <laughs> uh, it, it has been said that children are a great blessing. They are indeed. <laughs> they were a great comfort to you in your old age, and they help you re reach it sooner, too. <laughs> now, to get serious, think for, for a moment on how just one messed up family can affect this whole world. Just one messed up family. Adolf Hitler's father was authoritarian. He didn't have any idea on how to raise children except to have strict rules. There was constant conflict between the two until Hitler reached the age of 13, whereupon his dad died at 13 years old. Hitler refused to get a job to help support the poor family. And desiring to be an artist, he wandered off to Vienna, a vagabond at age 19. All through these critical years, Hitler was developing the theories that led to the Third Reich and to the Second World War that cost the world close to 50 million lives. 50 million lives. So we ask, what if Adolf Hitler had a father who knew how to train and discipline his child? What if he had a caring Christian family. In a way, it took the whole world to discipline him more than 30 years later because his family could not do it when he was young. Hitler's story, sad story, says something to us 
about the impact of just one family and the impact, the horrible impact it can have on our world. If families were doing what God intends them to do, a lot of things that happen in this world would not happen. Dr. Carl Manager, a famous psychiatrist who established a clinic in Topeka, Kansas, said once, a one-liner, what's done to children, they will do to society. What's done to children, they will do to society. I love one-liners. In fact, I've been teaching as a adjunct professor at Holy Cross Homiletics, and I've developed a theory that the best sermon is a good one-liner that everybody understands. Re repeat it and have the congregation repeat it back to you 50 times. So when they're asked during the week, what did the preacher speak on? You'll have it in a nutshell. It's a very short one-liner. What you do to society, to people in society, they will do to the world. Charles Manson, some of us remember him, a mass murderer, was born, very few of us remember this, to a 14-year-old prostitute who did not want him, who hated him. The abuse she heaped on him, he later heaped on society. Let me mention here by way of contrast, one Christian family, the legacy that one Christian family left. It's a remarkable legacy. They had 11 children to whom they passed on a godly heritage to, through two or three generations. Their offspring grew up very close to the church. They practiced family prayer at home and read the Bible together as a family. The family's descendants included the following. Thirteen college pres presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 66 physicians, 80 public officials, and 100 attorneys. Contrast this family with that of Hitler and Charles Manson. It was through families of such faith and learning that Christians once shaped the destiny of the American mind and the American character. If we hope to leave the same legacy, we must nurture godly families, encouraging our children and our grandchildren to exercise their faith in whatever vocation they choose, whether it be education, law, finance, religion, politics, whatever. In the words of a great American, Daniel Webster, this is very short, but it hits home. He wrote, quote, if we work on marble, it will perish. If on brass, time will efface it. If we rear up temples, they will crumble into dust. But if we work on immortal minds and hearts and imbue them with principles such as the fear of God, the love of our fellow man, 
we engrave on tablets that will shine brightly for many, many years. End of quote by Daniel Webster. The Gallup poll discovered that parents believe in bringing religion home, but very few of them practice it. They believe that the home is a very important place and it, religion occupies the most important place in the home, but very few of them practice it. Seventy-five percent of us, according to the poll, agree that home is the most important place for religious training. Yet, very few parents talk about God to their children or, which is even more important, pray with them. Another sign of trouble today is the fact that the transfer of values from the older generation to the younger generation, which is perhaps the most important thing that families do, is now being reversed. What do I mean by this? I mean that parents are now deriving their values from their children. I'm going to repeat that. Parents are now deriving their values from their children. Instead of children deriving their values from the parents. Contrast this with what Father Harry Pappas mentioned, the Old Testament, which says yesterday, he, quote, he spoke in the Old Testament, quote, these words which I command you this day shall be upon you and you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you should talk of them when you sit in your house and you, when you walk on the way so that when your son asks you in time to come, what's the meaning of these testimonies and statutes and the ordinances which the Lord our God has commanded, then you will say to them that we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt and he brought us out. Close quote. Now that's very interesting because Moses is speaking to all parents in these verses. He's telling them that first of all, God's word has to be, quote unquote, on their hearts because they cannot give what they do not have. So this method that's outlined for us in the Old Testament includes all kinds of informal, spontaneous conversations which occur during the many experiences of family life. Every day, God gives us countless choice opportunities to relate the word of God to the lives of our children. And when your son asks you in time to come, what's the meaning of this? In other words, who made me? Who made the world? Who is God? Where is God? What does he expect of me? The parents. The parents, says Moses. Not the priests, not the church, not the Sunday school. The parents are to respond to these questions. And yesterday I attended four workshops. One of them is, was by Dr. Anthony Vrain, who is conducts the religious education program for the Greek archdiocese. And in a sheet that he passed out, he quoted in, in on this sheet, Luke 1, 46 to 55, Mary's confession of faith 
and God. And it goes like this. It's a beautiful confession. My soul magnifies the Lord, she said, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. This is for people who deify Mary. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Let's never forget that. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has shattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Lucy Yiptochison. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Amen. So Dr. Graham, after quoting these words, and that's the that's the longest sermon, the longest quote of Mary that's found in the scriptures, because all the others are very, very short. And of course, the shortest of all her responses to God are, is what? One word, fiat, let it be done according to your will. Vienitito, the Fedimasu. And he asks, Imagine Mary singing this hymn more than once around the house as she was doing housework when Jesus was young, a young child. Name the values that Mary communicated, under, under, understand or highlight the key pieces of this text. Imagine little Jesus praying around the house and Mary singing this beautiful hymn constantly and he hearing it. It's an, uh, unbelievable. Uh, for me, Mary said Mary beautiful, many beautiful things in the Bible, but one of the most beautiful things it's a one-liner, by the way, and I, I happen to love one-liners. <laughs> she said to Jesus at the marriage in Cana of Galilee, she said to the servants, to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. And I think those are the best words she ever spoke next to fiat. The topic of this uh, discussion is synergy, church and home. A very important word in Orthodox spirituality is that word synergy. It's a Greek word. Orthodox theologians use this New Testament Greek word synergy to express the biblical meaning that God does not force his grace, his love upon us, but guides and strengthens us after we submit to his will. After, not before. And this is why he waits for Mary to say, fiat, let it be done. Synergy is derived from the Greek word synergy fellow servant, servants with God, used by Paul, St. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. It comes from two Greek words, sin, meaning S-Y-N, with, and ergon, meaning work. So we cooperate. He works with us, we work with him.
there are some sayings that adopt, are adopted by orthodox people without thinking. Un we unthinkingly quote them. And this is one of them. A parent is speaking to his children and he says, I'm not going to push my idea of right and wrong on you. I'm not going to push my right and wrong on you. How many parents, orthodox parents, have bought, literally bought this pagan philosophy of life lock, stock, and barrel? First of all, I'd like to say in rebuttal that this philosophy, this way of thinking, is, does not involve pushing anything. We all have a divine responsibility as Orthodox Christian parents not to push, but to share with our children, to share with them in love what God says is right and what God says is wrong. It's when we don't share our Christian values that our children get into trouble. Secondly, we are sharing not my idea of what is right or, and wrong, but God's standard. St. John Chrysostom, for example, calls on parents to quote-unquote train their children in virtue. Train your children in virtue, he says. I would add, as they train them in tennis, golf, and so on, to train them in virtue. Above all, he says, they should pray together, read the Bible together, uh, recite the stories of saints together. To all, all of this to provide good examples with which they can counteract the many bad examples they encounter in the world. One high school principal said this one-liner, too many of today's children have straight teeth and crooked morals. <laughs> too many of our children today have straight teeth, orthodontists, and crooked morals. In our Orthodox Christian tradition, the child begins to experience from early childhood the fullness of liturgical life. And this is exceedingly important. He kisses the cross. He tastes the Holy Eucharist. He or she lights candles. He or she kisses icons. He or she says the magic words of prayer with the parents. These are excellent, superbly excellent practices. The child is beginning to catch the faith from his or her parents. But, it's a very important word, but, in fact, as one Secretary of State instructed his translator, you may translate everything loosely, but when you come to but, I want a very literal translation. But all of these practices have no connection with the outside world of football, cars, school, etc. To the child, the real things have to have some connection with everyday life. If they have no connection to everyday life, they are not real. But when the child sees the same icons he sees at church at home, and he smells the same fragrant incense that he smells at church at home, and he is the priest reading the same Bible that his father reads at home. 
and sees the parents who pray at church, praying at home, then some very, very critical things begin to happen. Because faith, when brought home and practiced at home, becomes real to the child. Faith, when brought home and practiced at home, becomes real to the child. So let the child kiss the cross, taste the Holy Eucharist, kiss the icons, light the candle, say the magic words of prayer before bed and meals only. Let him or her say them with mom and dad at home and at church. One of the items that uh, Dr. Graham passed out yesterday in his workshop is the following. How often do your children see you reading the Bible, reading religious literature, saying prayer, saying a prayer by yourself, talking about the role of faith in your life, getting involved with ministry, the ministry of the parish, supporting the church or the parish financially, supporting a charity or a social justice cause, either financially or directly? Good question for a parent to ask himself, herself constantly. How often does my child see me praying? I mention this because I was brought up in a home, an Orthodox Christian home, that had a candidi, a votive light, and an icon, and a Bible. And it was in the hallway, and we would all stop and pray before it. But every morning, I remember my dad, who left at 4 o'clock in the morning to make it to the produce market in time to purchase supplies for his two stores, would always, and I would see this because my bedroom was very close to the icon stand. Stand before the icon, make the cross and pray before he left. And my mother would do the same. She would rise at six o'clock instead of four o'clock. So these, this, uh, I'm, not just, I'm not just saying this, I speak from experience. And they did not have to teach us prayer, by the way. They practiced it. And we caught it from them. Let me ask you a question now. Do you know what most determines behavior in the areas of drug and sex? What most determines behavior when it comes to drug and sex? The answer is values, faith, morals. Yet, most Orthodox Christian parents and the Search Institute, Youth Institute, which is based here in Minneapolis, discovered this. Most Christian parents do not talk, hesitate to talk values with their children. When it comes to values, most Christian parents are silent. Yet, the children want desperately to hear their parents saying, quote, as Orthodox Christians, this is what we believe about drugs. This is what we believe about sex. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It is not to be polluted by drugs or sexual impurity. These are our God-given values as Orthodox Christians. And your mom and dad pray 
that you will accept these values as we accept them. Some Christian families not only talk about values, but sit down, actually sit down with their children and draw up a list of their orthodox Christian family values. And some even encourage their children to memorize these values. And some, I don't know how valuable this is, I'll just pass it on. Some even reward their children financially for memorizing these values. So that the parents encourage their children to memorize these values and they talk about them and ask questions about them throughout the day. Bob Hope said once, I warn you, this is a one-liner by Bob Hope. <laughs> he was talking about the fact that their, the prayer in public schools was outlawed. He said, quote, as long as there are final exams, there will always be prayer in school. <laughs> Good old Bob Hope. He hit the nail on the head. A senator was invo invited to a local church, a local church's annual uh, men's dinner, which was attended, by the way, by hundreds of people. And the table conversation turned to prayer in schools. And when, a, when the senator's time came to address the group, he, he did so by asking this question. How many of you actually pray at home with your children? How many of you actually pray at home with your children? Out of the hundreds in attention, only two or three hands went up. So our homes must now become more orthodox, more Christian than ever. If our children may not pray at school, let them hear their parents praying at home. If they may not hear the Bible read at school, let them hear it read at home. They may take prayer and the Bible out of our schools, but they can never, never take it out of the most important school in this universe, and that is the home. George Santayana, who taught at Harvard, came out with this one-liner that I wholeheartedly agree with. A child educated only at school is an uneducated child. A child educated only at school is an uneducated child. So no prayer offered in a classroom, for example, will contain the love of an evening prayer with mom and dad. Let me say here that the most fundamental place where prayer can happen is in the home. The most fundamental. Prayer is crucial not only in nurturing a sense of worship but also, <clears throat> also in helping transmit Christian values. There is nothing like the power of prayer. Now parents, for example, can bless their children, and many of them do, making the sign of the cross on their forehead, have foreheads as they leave for school in the morning. They can embrace them, they can kiss them while they're still in their embrace. And the embrace itself will express a real warm, personal love for them, both God's love and their parents' love. As one child said, I need a hug, ma'am. I used up the last one. <laughs> I love that one. 
Father Andrew Greeley is a Roman Catholic sociologist, author of many books. I think he died very recently. He said once that he had discovered that attending parochial school and confirmation classes do not guarantee that a person, a child, will not leave the church later as he or she grows up. What really changes a person, said Father Andrew Greeley, and keeps him coming to church all his life is not attending parochial school or confirmation classes, but the fact that there was someone in that child's life who knew God personally, loved God unconditionally, and who himself had a personal relationship with God. Wow. I'm not saying this. Brother Andrew Greeley, a world noted sociologist, is saying this. He discovered this in his studies. So ideally, of course, this person is the parent. The Bible has a remarkable, well, one of many, one of innumerable remarkable statements that are to be found in the Bible. It's a verse that indicates that childbirth indi indicates that through childbirth a woman will be saved. That's fascinating. A woman will be saved through childbirth. Now, whatever else this verse may mean, it points to the most important role of women in the church. The work of procreation is only begun with the child's birth. Procreation does not end with childbirth. Parents continually create life, continually create personality in their children. How? Through the kind of family, faith, atmosphere they provide at home. Hence, through childbirth, a woman shall be saved. I ask, is there more a task, any task, more sacred, more exalted than this one. Mothers have the awesome privilege of being able to save the world through the kind of, this kind of childbirth, nurturing, and rearing. Yet, feminists today are seeking to get the mother out of the home, away from her children, and into the firehouse as a firefighter, into the police precinct as a gendarme, and even into the army as a combat soldier. With nobody at home, do we have to wonder why society is disintegrating? In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul in Romans 15, 5 says, Greetings also to the church that meets in their home. In Greek, it's called ekklesiula, the little church in the home. Even today, the home is called in Greek by that word ekklesiula, the little church. The little church is established as such as a little church by two sacraments in the Orthodox Church. First, the sacrament of holy matrimony, mat matrimony by which the couple is literally crowned as king and queen of the home. And secondly, by the sacrament of holy chrismation by which they are receive the Holy Spirit and are crowned, are received into the royal 
priesthood of believers, in effect, as little priests in the home. St. Clement of Alexandria wrote in the 13th century this one-liner. He said, marriage is more than human. It is a microvasilia. It is, he said, a miniature kingdom, which is the little house of the Lord. A miniature kingdom. So I repeat, it takes not one but two sacraments to ordain parents to serve as priests in the home. Holy matrimony and chrismation. St. John Chrysostom says, marriage is the, the union of man and woman that creates the little church, the ecclesiola. So our purpose as parents is to create a miniature kingdom of God in our homes, hence the crowns in the sacrament of matrimony. But the old excuse has always been and still is, but what do we parents, what can we do at home? What do we know? How can we teach our, ch our children what we ourselves don't know? How? And the answer is a very simple one. You don't have to know anything. You can learn. You can go out of your way to learn about other things in life that you know about, know nothing about, but are very interested in, such as golf, right? Tennis, right? <laughs> there are books written called Golf for Dummies. Tennis for Dummies. So if, you want, if, you're, really, if you're really interested in tennis, tennis, you'll buy one of these books and you'll soon become an expert. So excellent books are now at, your, at our disposal to show us some of the many things we can do at home with our children. It's, it's here in black and white. How to make God real in your home. How to make him real. Everything is outlined for you. You don't have to know anything. You can become an expert by reading books such as that. And parishes, I repeat, par this is very important, parishes need to plan seminars and workshops for parents to show them specifically how they can use a book like this and the ideas that come from this book in the home. It's not a matter of knowing. It's a matter of interest. It's a matter of learning. It's a matter of growing. It's a matter of prioritizing and putting first things first. Now, many families today already use, because this, is, this was written, I think, in the 70s, and it's written, it's very interesting how it was written. The idea came when we were having a, a Sunday school teachers meeting. The parents and the teachers were complaining that kids don't come to school, and we started talking and brainstorming the fact that how many, how many hours, if they do come to school, do they spend in church on Sunday? Maybe one hour? How many hours do they spend at home? 168 hours. So what can we do in one hour to make up for the 168 hours that they're at, that they're at home? So we have to enlist the help of the home. And that's why this book was written. Now, you can use this book. The home is the first and the most important church that the family will ever use. If they do not feel the presence of God at home, chances are they will not feel the presence of God anywhere else. We must make a deliberate and concerted effort to create a sense of the presence of God at home. The simple exercises outlined 
in this book will help each family to enjoy, to bask in the presence of God all week long. Often, we mistakenly feel that the church and the Sunday school are, exist in order to create and foster a sense of the presence of God in the lives of our children. Parents feel that the church school will take care of their child's religious faith and that they themselves have to do nothing but sit back and play tennis or golf. We forget that the church can only supplement supplement what is done at home. It can never take the place of the home. One hour a week at church cannot make up, possibly make up, for 168 hours a week that we're at home. And Jim Burns brought this up beautifully, only he talked about 40 hours a year versus 3,000 hours a year at home. So we urge all parents to make a deliberate effort to practice with their children the presence of God all week long through the exercises that are outlined in this beautiful book. This is a, a true story, by the way, and it's a magnificent story because it, it shows how the Holy Spirit is active today. One morning, a little girl asked her mother a very surprising question. And the question was, Mommy, it's a loaded question, by the way, whom do you love more, Jesus or me? Wow. Whom do you love more? Jesus or me? What a dilemma. If the mother answered Jesus, her daughter could get the feeling her feelings hurt. And if she answered the other way, her daughter might think that Jesus was just not very important in her life. But then, just then, the answer to the question flashed into her mind. And don't tell me it was not providential. It was the Spirit of God coming to her at that moment because she was at her wit's end. She didn't know how to answer. So the Lord, Lord stepped in with the answer. So she smiled. And as she smiled, she said, Why, honey, don't you know that the more I love Jesus, the more I love you? Oh. Hearing that, the child <laughs> reached over and gave her a huge hug. She said, as she hugged her, Mommy, please, Jesus, please love Jesus more and more and more. Indeed, the more we love Jesus, the more we love everybody else. That's what one, one of my favorite, favorite illustrations from the Church Fathers is one used by Saint Irenaeus. He says the Trinity is God the Father reaching two hands out to each one of us. One hand is Jesus, and one hand is the Holy Spirit. So you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit reaching out to us. And when we reach, come close to him and into our embrace, he closes the hands around us and love, kisses us. That's the Trinity for you. Now, how can parents teach moral principles to their children in a constructive way? This is a powerful question. How can parents teach moral beliefs to their children in a constructive way? I love what Jim, Jim Burns said last week during his powerful, power-packed presentations. He said, when a, when a child looks upon God as being a killjoy for giving us all these commandments. He said, he's the one who invented sex. He gave it to us, and he wants us to, to get the most out of it. That's why he's giving us these commandments. I'll never forget that. 
How can parents teach moral beliefs to their children in a, in a constructive way? The answer is simply by sharing their convictions. That's simple. Simply by sharing their convictions. One adolescent said, quote, I feel my parents were so afraid to step on our rights as individuals that they never told us how they feel about moral decisions and problems that we had to face. They never told us. He wished that his parents had expressed their moral convictions, but because they did not, he felt isolated and cut off from them. This is a discovery that was made by the Search Institute here in Minneapolis some years ago. Another adolescent said, quote, a parent should let us know when we are off track. It's true that most of the time we need freedom to decide what we should do in a given situation. But, but a parent has to warn and isolate an adolescent about some dangers. Otherwise, he or she might realize it when it's too late. Close quote. So another effective approach to helping adolescents internalize moral values is based on family discussions in which parents explain to their children moral values and why they are so important to them. According to an outstanding Harvard psychiatrist, Dr. Robert Coles, he said he made this statement about teaching our children values. Quote, I think that what children in the United States desperately need is a moral purpose. And a lot of our children here aren't getting that. They're getting parents who are very concerned about getting them into the right colleges, buying the best clothing for them, giving them an opportunity to, to live in neighborhoods where they'll lead fine and interesting voc vaca voc vacations and all sorts of things. Parents work very hard these days and they're acquiring things that they feel are important for their children. And yet vastly more important things are not happening. They're not spending time with their children. Close quote by Dr. Robert Coles of Harvard, a psychiatrist. Father Harry Pappas delivered a marvel, marvelous lecture yesterday on the Old Testament and the Old Testament views on raising, raising children. And I remember something I read many years ago about the most important piece of furniture in a Hebrew home in the Old Testament. The most important piece of furniture in the Old Testament home was the family kitchen table. <laughs> the family kitchen table was the most important piece of furniture. Why? Because that's where the family gathered each day when the, fa when the father of the family led them in family prayer. And when, uh, on Friday evening, they would celebrate that famous Paschal uh, feast, the whatever it's called, I forget now. Now, how often, Dr. Graham asked, how often does your family have dinner together at home at the table? And how often does this dinner begin with a prayer? We have much to learn from the Old Testament because everything, everything they did began with prayer 
and ended with prayer. And I live in a Jewish neighborhood, and right now they have put up booths so that they spend some time in the booth each day to remind them that their forebearers on their 40-year journey from Egypt to the Promised Land lived, had, n had no homes. They lived in booths. So uh, it's so important. I remember that bringing up our children, uh, we, you, we always met after the family meal. We would not leave the table. We would stay there. We would use a book. I think it came out in two volumes. It was entitled Little Visits with God. It had a story and then questions on the story. And we would start a conversation on the teachings that came to us from that book. So there was a lot of good family conversation taking place around the family table. And this, is, this was not new. It came to us from the Old Testament. And the New Testament comes out of the Old Testament. So the family table is an exceedingly, exceedingly important piece of furniture. Now a few words about internalizing the faith through love. Inter internalizing our faith through love. Studies have shown that children learn from those they love. Children learn from those they love. If they love you, children will eagerly accept your faith and your value system. If they don't love you, they will rebel. Hence the, important of cre the importance of creating a family atmosphere where love prevails. This cannot be done without God and family prayer, without carving out a specific period of time to be completely present to God and to each other. This is one for the refrigerator door. It's a one-liner. Whom you would change, you must first love. Whom you would change, you must first love. Put it on your refrigerator door. It's something very, very important. A child comes to know God's love through the love that he or she experiences from the parents. The first icon of God that a child ever sees is the icon of mom and dad leaning over the crib, gloating over him, over her. The first icon. So the love of parents is not just an analogy of God's love. It reveals God's love. The child learns to love by being loved. And children first love because they were first loved by God. First John 4.10 And as, as Archbishop Demetrius, he spoke on Ephesians 3.14-19 to 19, said, verse 19, And to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. And to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. So children can love through our loving them. And this, and this as a role for the parents is hugely central. Thus the most important thing in a family in an Orthodox Christian family, is love, that parents love each other. Parents love each other. This is where it all begins. And an extension of that love is the child. Only thus can they create an atmosphere at home where love 
prevails. Now abide faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. I was reading, as I normally do in the morning, the New Testament, and I came to the verse that even if you have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, you have nothing. And I said to myself, can you imagine that? A faith so strong that it can move mountains and it's nothing without love? Wow. Hence the importance of, the, of those words. Now by faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Bruno Bettelheim, the famous child psychologist, said that a child's moral choices are not based on abstract concepts of right and wrong. This is important because he's a world-famous child psychiatrist. A child's moral choices are not based on abstract concepts of right and wrong. They are based on people he loves and admires. In Beth, Beth Bettelheim's words, quote, the question for the child is not, do I want to do good? But whom do I love and want to be like? Whom do I love and want to be like. Every one of us is, is, of course, the Bible tells us this, and we believe it, is a, an icon of God, an icon that has been damaged through sin. So every one of us is like an, an, an image of God, an icon of God, albeit damaged by sin. But if I were given an icon that was damaged by sin or time or circumstances or human hatred, I would treat it with great reverence and tenderness. I would pay attention not to the fact that it has been damaged. I would concentrate on what remains of its beauty. This is exactly what we must learn to do with people, especially with our children. Every one of us, no exceptions, is a damaged icon who has not been wounded by sin or suffering or, or hatred or excessive criticism. We must learn to, to look and look and look until we come to see by God's grace the inner beauty of the image of God in each person, however marred. I would pay attention not primarily to the fact that this image, this icon has been damaged. I would concentrate on what, it's, what, has been, what is left of its beauty. And that is exactly what, me, what we must learn to do with people especially, especially our children. For who has not been wounded by sin or suffering or hatred or excessive criticism? We must continue to look and look and look and look very patiently and with God's love and grace to the inner beauty of the inner, of the inner person. Each person then, only then can each person begin to help that inner beauty, inner beauty to blossom and to show forth. For unless we strengthen the image of God in us and encourage that image to grow, it will die. We all need encouragement and we need it all the time. Encouragement is something that we all have and we can all give to people because everybody 
including ourselves. Everybody needs encouragement. We need it for ourselves, we need it for others, and we need it especially for our children. I cannot, I cannot emphasize the importance of encouragement for our children. For we are all damaged icons in need of repair. Damaged icons that need to be brought to the master iconographer, Jesus, for renewal and restoration. And here I'm reminded of the many icons of, in the Middle East that have been damaged uh, and are now in the process of being renewed. I read recently a book written by a, a person who was an Ang Anglican. He later became Orthodox. He, said he had spent many years in Russia before the turn of the century. His name is Stephen Graham. And he wrote the following in his book about the Russian people. And I'd like to share this brief paragraph with you. It's on icons. Every Russian home has its icons. The icon claims the home and the man for God. It indicates God's ownership. If the icon is in religion, what trademark is to commerce? In every Russian home, there is an icon, even in railway waiting rooms, public houses, prison cells. It occupies what is known as the right corner of every room. That is the corner towards the rising sun. It is not, not strictly proper to sit with one's back to it. And indeed, parents, peasants' tables are often arranged so that it is impossible for one to sit with his back to the icon. He says, if you sleep in a Russian home, the, home, the icon with its votive lamp before it looks down upon you all night long. In reverence to the icon, you remove your hat when entering a room. It is a sign that God is in that room with you. It owns the room, or rather is a presence. God is a presence in that room. Outside, he says, are the sun, the moon, the stars. Inside, the icon takes their place. Close quote. That's beautiful. Thus the family icon, which is a call to family prayer, becomes really a God-given tool for theosis, tool for union, with God, a tool for Christification. It seems that today everybody has left the closet. Everybody's out of the closet. You hear that expression quite often. The prostitutes, for example, have left the closet. They're now marching out in the streets demanding their rights. And the same is true with homosexuals. They're no longer in the closet. They are marching in the streets demanding their rights gay rights. There is practically no one left in the closet, by the way. <laughs> except, except a large group still hiding there in the shadows of darkness. And you know who that group is? They're the Christians. We're still in the closet. They are practically the only people left in the closet, by the way. They are afraid to let the world know that they are followers of Jesus. They hide their faith in the shadow of the closet. While the Christians are in the closet, the atheists and the humanists, secular humanists, are out turning the world upside down. And I mean that literally. The Bible talks about Joseph of Arimathea. He was a closet Christian. A 
Christian, but the Bible says he was a Christian who, quote-unquote, took courage. And he left the closet after the resurrection. And he left to declare himself publicly for Jesus by appearing before Pilate and asking for the body of Jesus so that he could bury it. He came out of the closet and proclaimed publicly that he was a Christian. And we Christians need to come out of the closet. Need to come out. The world needs to know that we're there. Okay, we're coming to the end now. How many of us have heard it said time and again, it takes a village to raise a child? Well, it takes even our current president uses it. It takes a village to raise a child. But he means it takes the government to raise a child. Let's beware. <laughs> it doesn't take the church or the home. They're out. It takes the government. And the government has to step in and raise the child. The village is indeed important, but we must never, never abdicate the responsibility of raising a child solely, solely to the village. Christian parents are personally responsible by God for nurturing their child's body, mind, and spirit. If they are not doing so, it is a sp- the responsibility of the church, of the village, that is, the church, to remind them of this moral and spiritual obligation. St. Paul tells us in Ephesians about this peculiar Christian village, which is the church. It takes all of us. But the question is, you know, what do we mean today by village? Do we mean schools where prayer is not allowed and where God's name is not permitted to be mentioned? Is this village, is this the village that you think should raise your child? Do we mean degrading TV shows and movies that introduce the gutter experiences of life to our children and the hearts of our children? Is this the village that you think should be raising our children? It seems that today we need to protect our children from that kind of village. The true village for us Orthodox Christians is the church, is the parents first, and the church, and all of us together. I remember the story by a certain Father Philotheos, who used to teach at our seminary, but he left and he went to church and he wrote a marvelous book, by the way. And he said, when he was serving as a priest in a parish, there was always an old, old-timer sitting in the end pew. So that as, the children's, as the children would leave church, he would pinch each, each hug and throw a blessing and kiss at every one of them. He said, that person even though he was an old-timer, was a religious educator. He was teaching that child that the church is the place of love and that the church is a village in which he or she is truly, really loved by everyone. And he was showing the fact that he loved them. Now, we come to the end. I'm going to mention something by Dr. Bujamra. Bujamra was, does anybody remember Dr. Bujamra? He was an Antiochian scholar in religious education. In a very short paragraph, he said something that we should memorize. This is, this is, this, these are his words. All we can do is educate our children into the church. Educate our children into the church. We cannot educate them into faith. We can educate our children into church. We cannot educate them into faith because that comes as an act 
of the will as, as, as an act of God's grace. All we can do is prepare, prepare people to receive it, and that happens in the church and in the home. Close quote. So Dr. Bujama, whom I admired very much, said something very significant. We can and we should be doing everything we can to educate our children into the faith, but we cannot educate into the church, but we cannot educate them into the faith. And that's why we as parents have to be praying for our children night and day, because only God can educate them into the faith so that it becomes their faith, so that they live and die by that faith. I like this, this uh, expression. The child is like a bridge connecting mother to the father so that the three become one flesh as when two cities divided by a river are joined by a bridge. That's beautiful. So if the child is a bridge connecting mother and father, just imagine how much traffic, how much prayer, how much interaction should be passing over that bridge to mold and make that child into the image of God. I love this. This is a short prayer from St. Basil's liturgy. It says, quote, maintain their marriage bonds in peace and concord. Nurture the infants. Instruct the young. Protect the orphans. You know the name and age of each according to their mother's womb. Now I'd like to conclude with this brief conversation between a rabbi and a Christian minister. The rabbi said to the minister, you Christians have a distinct advantage over us Jews. When I mention God in a sermon as a rabbi, many of our people have a, dis have a vague, a very vague concept of somebody way out there who's very hard to relate to. But when you Christians mention God, your people can visualize Jesus so easily. And he becomes one that they can identify with God. So when you mention God, Jesus comes to mind. When we mention God, he's someone out there somewhere, but far away and very vague. So I, would, I, I personally would like to thank God for making himself so easily, easily understandable to all of us. And when it comes to sharing him and confessing him to our children, it becomes much easier because we have a marvelous example before us. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, whose love, whose love for us surpasses all knowledge. So when we come to the kernel that expresses the meaning of the New Testament, John 3.16, God so loved the world, personalize it. It's too extensive. He means that his love is a worldwide love, but it means also that it's a very special, very personal love. God so loved you by name that he gave his only begotten son so that you by name might not perish but have eternal life with him in heaven. Thank you for bearing up with me.